Good morning. I'm Ann Collins, Duke class of 82 and co-chair of Duke Boston. I'm so pleased that you're joining us for this fall's Duke Boston Business Breakfast. What a timely and important speaker and topic we have lined up for you this morning. Really looking forward to Bart Haynes talking to us about Duke's building a COVID treatment and vaccine. And I hope you'll think about joining us for our next Duke Boston event on November 18th when we host an after Zoom following DAA's Being Human in the Age of AI. Before introducing our moderator for today's program, I'm gonna take you through a few housekeeping notes. Please keep yourself muted throughout the program. It makes for a much more enjoyable experience for all of us. Also should know we can mute you, don't make us mute you. Um, I'm gonna also ask and recommend that you keep your video off so that participants can see the speakers and the presentation material. This preserving bandwidth will again enhance the experience. For best viewing, go to the upper corner, the upper right-hand corner and select your view to gallery view. With the housekeeping behind us, it's now my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Boston local Carmichael Roberts. Carmichael's Duke 90, PhD 95, a Duke parent and member of the Duke Board of Trustees. Long list of accomplishments, but man, am I jealous thinking of being on campus with that Duke 1990 hoop team. Coming to Boston, Carmichael was a National Science Foundation Fellow at Harvard and earned his MBA from MIT. He's a founding partner of Material Impact, a fund that builds valuable companies solving real world problems using innovative materials technology. He is a senior member of Breakthrough Energy, a mission-oriented group chaired by Bill Gates, committed to creating and building companies that address climate change and the long-term sustainability of our planet. Carmichael's dedicated to advancing medical products for developing nations. He joined with public prolific inventor and well-known Boston personality, George Whitesides, Harvard professor, to co-found Diagnostics for All, a nonprofit organization that's using materials platform to make low cost diagnostics for poor and rural populations in developing nations. Elected to the Board of Trustees in 2013, Carmichael is a member of the Executive Committee and Chair of the External Engagement Committee. He's also on the Climate Change and Sustainability Strategic Task Force. In 2017, he was appointed to the Duke University Health System Board of Directors and currently serves on the Audit and Compliance Committee. He and his wife, Sandra Park, who's also a double dookie, live in Brookline, Massachusetts with their three children. Welcome Carmichael, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Anne. That was a fantastic intro. And I just wanna welcome everybody here. You know, Anne said it best, um, what a perfectly timed um, event, uh, considering where we sit today with COVID, um, with both hope and, uh, and concern in terms of what's, uh, what's going on throughout the country. Um, this is going to be a fun talk. I have to say, um, I bet many of you don't really know Bart um, and have a sense of uh, him, the person. I'm going to talk about him on paper, but just to bring him to life a little bit, Bart's going to do a fantastic job of not only going through the technical side of, of things, but also just talking really plain human uh, normal speak that you will understand uh, some of your basic uh, questions that you may have in your hand in your head. Speaking of which, along the way as Bart is talking, please feel free to send through questions uh, because on the back end of, of Bart's uh, presentation, he's graciously carved out uh, time to, to handle Q&A, even if it goes past the uh, so-called top of the hour that we're, we're stopping at. So um, it should be a fun dialogue, even in the Q and A. So let me um, let me uh, kick this off by starting uh, by talking a little bit about Bart. So many of you already know Bart uh, Haynes is the director of the Human Vaccine Institute, um, and today he's going to talk about uh, how they've been developing safe and effective vaccine treatments and tests for COVID nineteen. But I would urge you to also think uh, about a glimpse into how their preparation also helps us consider what could happen in the future and in, in the next viral pandemic, which we have to consider. Um, fun fact for Bart, you ask about the future. He, uh, he actually trained in the lab of uh, Dr. Anthony uh, Fauci 
at NIH. And they've been actually close friends and colleagues since back in the 1970s. So Bart has a really unique perspective right now beyond just um, being at Duke. Uh, his title is, he's actually the Frederick Haynes Professor of Medicine and Immunology, in addition to being a director of the Vaccine Institute. He's, all, uh, he's in the School of Medicine. Um, he was Chief of Division of Rheumatology, Allergy, um, and clinic, Clinical Immunology, and later was even uh, Chair of the Department of Medicine. Um, Bart arrived to Duke the same uh, day that Mike Krzyzewski arrived to Duke. So we got two gems um, at, this, at the same time, and I hope we can keep both of them as long as possible. Um, not surprisingly, Bart has won many awards. Let me name a few. Uh, he was the winner of the Alexander Fleming Award for in, the, from the Infectious Disease Society of America. Uh, he won the Ralph Steinman Award for Human, human Immunology uh, uh, Research for the, from the American Association of Immunologists. He's uh, again, well regarded throughout the world as a member of the National Academy of Medicine, National Academy of Inventors, uh, the Academy, um, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, um, many more that we can talk about. You know, one thing I often mention the, um, the Duke Human Vaccine Institute, and a lot of people didn't, don't know that it ex exists. Of course, now in COVID, we are well aware of it. Um, this team that's there is outstanding. Uh, they have 15 years of experience in developing vaccines around things like uh, efforts around things like HIV, Zika, and the flu, to name a few. Uh, World-class facilities, to give you a sense, um, the, uh, the, the, the uh, Institute uh, has a regional biocontainment lab laboratory, an RBL. Um, if you don't know what that is, just keep in mind, it's, it's, it sounds exactly like it, it sounds is what it is. It's just one of 12 of them in, uh, throughout the US and it's funded by NIH to secure um, any emerging uh, infectious agents. So uh, one of a very few. They have a GMP good manufacturing practice facility that allows for productions of vaccines and therapeutics. So they actually can scale up and make things uh, in a cost effective and timely manner. I know Bart will do a much better job of explaining some of these. So let me just transition over to Bart by saying, you know, since the beginning of the pandemic, you know, Bart and his team have been working tirelessly to combat this pandemic. Since uh, back in March, um, Bart himself served as a member on an NIH active committee, which uh, where he advised directly on the COVID vaccine development. Uh, he served as the co-chair of that subcommittee on vaccine safety, perhaps the biggest topic that's coming around now since people are starting to see that vaccines are moving towards approval. Safety is top of mind. And so today, Bart, uh, I wanna welcome you so that everyone can hear uh, about the great progress that's been made in part due to you and your team. Uh, and we wanna thank you for that uh, in advance. Bart, please take it away. All right, thank you so much, Carmichael. What a um, lovely introduction and, and uh... Uh, uh, way too much, but it, it, very, very nice. It's a, it's a pleasure and truly an honor to uh, be here today to talk to um, all of you about the COVID-19 pandemic and what's been going on at Duke um, since the pandemic began. Uh, as a conflict of interest statement, I just need to say that I have patent applications for SARS-CoV-2 antibodies for test designs and COVID-19 COVID-19 vaccine candidates that I'll discuss in this talk. So over the next few minutes, we'll talk about the uh, Duke Human Vaccine Institute, uh, talk about our three-part strategy to respond to the epidemic uh, on the campus. Um, how do we prepare for this moment? What comes next? And then end with uh, summarizing and sharing our story. So what is the Duke Human Vaccine Institute? Uh, it's made up of a mission, facilities and people. Our mission is that the DHVI or the Vaccine Institute, abbreviated DHVI, will develop vaccines and therapeutics that will be available to and accessible by everyone for diseases of global importance while training the next generation of scientists. The facilities um, are, as Carmichael mentioned, we have an NIH constructed regional biocontainment laboratory uh, built in 2002 <clears throat> amid actually great concern about we'll be bringing all of these terrible bugs to, to Duke and Durham. Uh, in point of fact, uh, all we had to say was, well, the research is going on right now in an inadequate space, and this gives us state-of-the-art space, and uh, no more was said. Uh, it was welcomed by the town of Durham. We had two terrific um, editorials in the Durham paper about this. We invited 
all of the city mothers and fathers to come and visit it before it went into operation. And it's been viewed as a resource for the community to respond to pandemics. Uh, in 2006, uh, it opened with investments from the NIH and Duke. And as Carmichael said, it's one of, uh, I think now 13 nationally, they've added another. Uh, yes, uh, also we have a, what's called a GMP or good manufacturing practice facility. We first suite opened in 2015. And then we got a grant from the NIH to build four more new suites that are opening uh, as we speak. So we have a, a very robust uh, capacity for making our own vaccines, putting them in the bottles and moving them out the door um, uh, for clinical trials. And then finally, uh, Duke has acquired um, uh, an $8 million cryo-electron microscope called the Titan Creus um, that allows us to look at the molecular level on the order of weeks instead of years to look to see how antibodies and viruses are interacting. And I'll show you an example of that. <clears throat> so it's important to note that protection from SARS-CoV-2 infection is, is primarily mediated by um, immune molecules called neutralizing antibodies. Well, how do neutralizing antibodies work? These are antibodies produced by our immune cells that bind to these red spikes. This is a coronavirus up here in the corner on all the slides that bind to this red spike and prevent <clears throat> the virus from infecting our cells. So one way it, it blocks these. And the second way is that when antibodies bind here, uh, it, it targets this virus particle for being gobbled up by other cells of the immune system and removed from the circulation. And so our three-part strategy is to isolate and ultimately to produce in the test tube large amounts of neutralizing antibodies isolated from people with COVID-19. Um, and to be able to give this to either prevent the infection or to treat those who are already infected. Secondly, we're working on vaccines, uh, uh, second generation vaccines. So, and this is either the administration of viral proteins, which is a traditional way of giving a vaccine, or as you'll hear, another way to give a vaccine is to give the gene for the vaccine in the form of what's called a messenger RNA. Um, and we're actually doing that with administering antibodies as well. The traditional way is to give it as a protein, and we are now will be the first to um, develop a, a preventive and therapeutic um, antibody by giving the gene for the antibody and letting the gene make it in the body. And then third, and, and of equal importance, is we're working hard to develop rapid and affordable tests, not only for the Duke community in the state of North Carolina, but for um, any organization or a municipality that might uh, need them and to make them available at cost um, uh, during the pandemic. So let's talk about preventive and therapeutic antibodies. Here are two antibodies that you've probably heard about and read about in the paper. The first is by a company called Regeneron. It has a two antibody cocktail. Uh, it was used to treat the president and it's been in the news. It prevents virus escape because it has two antibodies that if something escapes one antibody, it can be uh, uh, hit by the other antibody, and it has been shown to protect uh, uh, against infection in animal models of monkeys and hamsters. Um, <clears throat> it's now in clinical trials uh, of, and been in about four or 500 people. Um, another company, Eli Lilly, has an antibody that has been shown to accelerate the, national, the natural decline in viral load in outpatients. Um, and so for people with mild and moderate disease, it looks like it really helps people get well sooner. It is less likely to be a benefit for hospitalized patients because the clinical trial was just stopped this week for patients in the intensive care units. And this antibody uh, was shown that it was too late to work in people who um, are already seriously ill. But it also just got approved this week for use in mild to moderate patients by the uh, FDA. So uh, while, um, 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 and actually before the onset of the pandemic, uh, what uh, DHVI has been doing is for the past three years, we've been funded by the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, probably better known to you by DARPA. DARPA gave us the internet, uh, uh, a lot of other good things, a lot of other not so good things during the Vietnam War. Um, and, um, but now they're involved in, helping uh, society respond to pandemics. And they put out a program several years ago called the Pandemic Preparedness Program, of which we were one of four awardees. 
Uh, and what the Department of Defense wanted us to do, uh, DARPA is in the Department of Defense, they wanted us to do something that was really sort of outside the box. And they, they wanted us to be able to take a sample um, and um, uh, after a viral outbreak, and we may not even have known what the virus is, grow it, figure out what the virus was, uh, label it, uh, use the label virus to pull out antibodies from the immune system and the test tube, uh, find the antibodies that are neutralizing and uh, grow the virus in 15 days, isolate the antibody in 25 days. That's actually, 25 days is actually easy for us. This is our platform technology um, that, that we already knew how to do. And then with our GMP facility, manufactured in 20 days. Well, making a protein in 20 days is, is almost impossible, probably is impossible. But one can manufacture the gene, the nucleic acid, the messenger RNA, and that's what we're doing to be able to administer antibodies as messenger RNA. And again, what that does is, is that when you put a, the gene in the body, then the gene makes the antibody um, uh, and uh, compared to just giving the protein as, as, a, as a drug. And they wanted us to be able to do this in 60 days. Well, that turned out to be impossible. Nobody has been able to do that. Uh, but we have been able to do this on the order of 90 to 120 days. And so we were working on influenza. We thought the next big one was gonna be pandemic influenza. And when COVID-19 uh, um, came around at the end of December, 1st of January, uh, what DARPA said was, okay, you're it, go for it. And that's what we've been doing. And so we isolated over 2,000 antibodies from SARS-CoV-2 individuals and tested each one for reactivity to the virus. We found the best neutralizing antibodies that neutralized uh, potently and prevented virus infection of cells. And we tested these antibodies. And so here are these little Y-shaped um, uh, molecules around here uh, on the top of this blue this um, um, blue spike protein. This blue spike protein is a representation of the red spikes on this virus um, particle over here on the right. And so this is the blue uh, uh, virus particle blown up. And this structure was solved on that uh, cryo-electron microscope that I talked about. We found three antibodies that bind at three different places on the virus at the same time. And so this is a, a cryo-electron micrograph of the spike protein. Now, actually with each of these three antibodies stuck to um, uh, this, um, uh, top of this spike protein. So this is what we're trying to get to to neutralize the virus. And by having a cocktail of three antibodies, one can lessen the possibility that this virus might escape or mutate or change uh, and to get away from the antibody. The reason I say that is because COVID, um, uh, excuse me, SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus and RNA viruses tend to mutate much more than other viruses. HIV is the worst and most uh, mutating of all virus forms that we work with. Uh, fortunately, this virus is nowhere uh, as uh, uh, mutating and nearly as much as HIV, but it is an RNA virus. And so we're developing three protective and potent neutralizing antibodies. And this shows that they're bound to this, this what's called the spike protein. And so then we take the antibodies and we infuse the, the antibodies either alone or in combination, either in mice uh, or in monkeys. And then the animals are in experimentally infected um, and challenged with SARS-CoV-2 at time periods after administration of the antibodies. And what we've seen is, is, is and which is great news and what others have seen uh, with the commercial vaccines that we'll talk about in a moment, is that there's protection with no SARS-CoV-2 replication in the lung. So we think that antibodies will work. And as I said, the Lilly antibody appears to work uh, in mild to moderate cases, less so in severe cases, and we're hopeful that we can develop an antibody cocktail that will work for very sick people. Now, the short-term antibody treatment uh, with uh, antibodies uh, that is passively giving what, an, what a vaccine will induce, um, uh, the Department of Defense uh, has now uh, funded us very recently to take the best antibody into the clinic as a messenger RNA. They've given us a contract for uh, over $7 million, and we're manufacturing these, this gene at Duke and the human trials hopefully will begin after the first of the year. We're also working on developing protein antibodies uh, with companies to use all three antibodies for a next generation therapeutic. Now let's move to uh, vaccine development in the US. There, as you have read, I'm sure that there are more than 200 teams working worldwide on a vaccine in a race to get a vaccine to the public. And this is great, this is good. 
we really need a lot of shots on goal here. And <clears throat> uh, because of the severity of the pandemic and the global nature. Uh, here are five of the leaders um, uh, uh, in the pharmaceutical industry in the United States and in Europe, uh, Moderna, uh, here in, is there in Boston, uh, where many of you are, uh, is, has made a, a messenger RNA encoding the viral spike protein. That's these red spikes on this virus particle over here. Pfizer, that's been in the news, and we'll talk more about this, is also making a very similar mRNA encoding the viral spike protein. AstraZeneca has a, 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 a virus, a, a coal virus from, the, uh, from, from monkeys called a chimpanzee adenovirus. That express, that's been engineered to express the spike protein gene. Um, Novavax uh, and Sanofi in combination with GSK are making proteins to traditional vaccines um, that are, are more similar to what uh, are vaccines that we, we and our children commonly take now. <clears throat> so uh, what Bardo, which is a um, division of HHS, has funded several companies at yeah, either a, a half a billion or uh, almost $2 billion to each to make, uh, both to make a vaccine and began in uh, January, February uh, to incent companies to make 100 million or more doses at their own risk before the efficacy trials had even started, let alone ended. And so uh, a lot of folks worry about whether the, the natural uh, sequence of vaccine development is being circumvented and for safety and all of those milestones, it's not being circumvented. What's being circumvented is that usually we wait until an efficacy trial is positive and then wait another two, three years for the vaccine to be scaled up so that it can be rolled out to the public. Uh, here, uh, it's all being done at risk. So four of the five were initially funded. Uh, uh, Pfizer was not, uh, but Pfizer has recently been funded last July to go ahead and to make uh, 100 million doses. And I think they got almost $2 billion from the government the promise for that, that the money will be uh, 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 paid when, when the vaccine doses are delivered. And so the government is, 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 is working hard and the government had uh, vaccine trials for HIV for all of the kinds of diseases. They took all of these trial capacities so they didn't have to set them up. They were there, the clinicians were there, the sites were there, et cetera. And for each one of these vaccines, 30,000 volunteers um, are being enrolled uh, for those vaccines that are started their efficacy trials. Uh, and the trials will run about a year. Duke is one of many vaccine enrolling sites and Duke has studied uh, and enrolled for the Pfizer vaccine and for the AstraZeneca vaccine. An important point is these efficacy trials need to go until their completion to acquire the maximum efficacy and safety data. That's really, really important. Uh, and should not be short-circuited and um, uh, should continue to be emphasized. Now, this is what came out two days ago on November 9th um, and got everybody's attention that the Pfizer, uh, uh, in collaboration with a German company called BioNTech, uh, say that their COVID vaccine is more than 90% effective and that this is a great day for science and humanity. And we were all thrilled because we have been worried that the vaccine is only gonna be 50% effective or 60 or 70 but 90% is, is just wonderful. And it, it means that what uh, we've been observing in animal models um, that uh, low levels of neutralizing antibodies can protect may well translate to humans. And so that's very, very exciting. Um, so what are the next steps? Well, um, uh, the, the goal is to acquire about 160 events, meaning infections out of the 30,000 people in the trial. Um, uh, Pfizer made this announcement after 94 events had been uh, acquired, they will continue to run the trial until they acquire all the 160 or so events, and then the trial will close. And then after that, the FDA will begin what's called post um, licensure surveillance, assuming that the vaccine is licensed. So when can we expect that this vaccine will be available? Well, the, the, the FDA has required that you have to have two months of safety data after everybody's been enrolled. And uh, that hopefully will be available sometime around December. Um, and then uh, this company and other companies will um, um, apply for what's called an, an EUA, an emergency use, au use authorization from the FDA. And then uh, this vaccine and the Moderna vaccine have to be uh, kept at uh, very low temperatures, um, minus 90 uh, degrees. Uh, and um, that pre presents great logistical problems for deployment and prioritization uh, uh, and getting it out to the public. 
not to mention that uh, uh, a, a large number of, of vaccine doses need to be made. And it's gonna be a two dose vaccine. So that means double the amount of material. Um, and then prioritization of who gets it first. Uh, and we can talk about that. So what is Duke doing with regard to vaccine development? We're working on second generation vaccines. We're working on three areas, potency, safety, and the future. For potency, uh, we're working on if the first generation vaccines are not sufficiently potent, uh, uh, or last long enough, then we'll have a vaccine. We, we aim to have a vaccine that can be used to boost the existing vaccines from the first generation. And also to, we're working to make sure that the vaccines we design will neutralize escape viruses. Because as I said, this is an RNA virus that mutates. Safety, I co-lead, as, as, as uh, Carmichael said, I co-lead the safety subcommittee of the NIH Accelerating COVID-19 Therapeutic Interventions and Vaccines. This is the head of the NIH, uh, Francis Collins Committee called ACTIVE. It's a working group. Um, and um, we've, we've, we've worked hard to figure out and to message for the public um, uh, how likely are these vaccines to be safe. And then secondly, and I'll briefly mention, DHVI is performing work on just how safe the vaccines might be. And third, for the future, we're making a vaccine for the next animal to human coronavirus. Uh, that is a pan-coronavirus vaccine. Uh, we've had two out, three outbreaks now of coronaviruses over the past 24 years. Uh, MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, uh, severe um, uh, SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome, and now COVID-19. And so we can expect more of these viruses to come out. Uh, the estimations are is that there are a huge number of viruses in animals with the potential for human transmission. This work is in collaboration with, uh, with UNC as well as the Vaccine Institute. So what progress has been made? We were making two kinds of vaccines. We're also using the genetic RNA uh, platform because we've been using that for four years uh, to make our HIV vaccine uh, um, candidates. Uh, and we're also uh, making uh, spike proteins in various forms for boosting. The vaccines are being tested in animal models of SARS-CoV-2 and they have, have induced very high levels of neutralizing antibodies and they're being challenged with the virus and animals are being protected. So we're really excited, particularly with the news coming out in humans that this vaccine is, 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 is going to be um, made uh, in some form and get to the public. Um, some, some, some vaccine is gonna be made and get to the public and soon and to end this pandemic. The additional next generation vaccine designs for boost are now being tested in monkeys for potency and durability. We have no idea how long the vaccines are going to uh, protect uh, there is concern because there are four different kinds of viruses that cause the common cold that are coronaviruses, and those antibodies don't last a long time. So you can continue to get the same virus as a cold year after year. So what is the concern for coronavirus safety that everyone is talking about? And that's because previous epidemic coronaviruses, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome or MERS, the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome or SARS, both induced antibodies that enhanced infection in the test tube and in some animal models and enhanced infection in the setting of vaccination. And so um, this is a paper that came out about 10 days ago that was the result of this committee that I co-chair with Ann Arvin at Stanford uh, of the uh, active uh, committee um, and um, where, where we reviewed all of the existing literature um, and other diseases that have been reported to have enhancing antibodies and with coronavirus. And the, the bottom line of the report is, is that the animal and test tube data suggests that vaccine antibody induced enhanced infection is going to be unlikely with COVID-19, but it is critical as with any vaccine to complete all clinical trials and safety evaluations uh, in order to find any problem that might pop up with the vaccines. And so what we decided to do was to ask the question, are antibodies that enhance infections in the test tube biologically relevant when uh, in the setting of COVID-19 infection or vaccination? And so we found, we looked hard for SARS-CoV-2 uh, um, enhancing antibodies. And we found that SARS-CoV-2 induces in people infection enhancing antibodies, just like SARS and MERS does. Uh, when you assay these and measure them in the test tube for infection of cells, and so, we, so what, what no one's ever done is to take these antibodies and put them in animals and see, 
does it enhance infection in an animal? So we isolated these antibodies and directly asked if they enhanced infection in the animal models of SARS-CoV-2 infection. And so the, uh, we, we asked that question and we tested SARS-CoV-2 enhancing antibodies in the test tube and we took them and we put them in animal models of COVID-19. And so there on the left is the antibody that enhanced infection in the test tube. We uh, treated mice and monkeys uh, with the various antibodies, did many different experiments. Then after the antibody was given, the mice and monkeys were challenged with SARS-CoV-2. And wonderful news is that in none of the experiments and none of the challenges did we see enhancement of infection or disease. And so <clears throat> we hope that this, as this information becomes available, it will help allay fears of COVID-19 vaccination. Of course, the final proof is going to be the final results from the uh, trials, the efficacy trials for safety uh, in humans, and also what's called post-licensure surveillance. Even after the vaccines are approved, the FDA will set up uh, surveillance of people who are still being vaccinated because these vaccines have the possibility of going in uh, hundreds of millions or, or billions of, of people. And so we have to know uh, what the infrequent side effects are. So um, let's move finally now to test development, SARS-CoV-2 antigen test uh, to determine if infected. So um, we need an ex inexpensive infection test so that frequent retesting is feasible and cost-effective and people can know whether they can go out in public, go to school, go out to work. Now DHVI, and I'll show you a video in a moment uh, that tells this story, has developed a genetic PCR test for use at Duke. And it's been the key for Duke being able to open and stay open and control the infections on campus. Um, and so what we're also now doing is the next stage of this at DHVI is taking those best antibodies for binding to the coronavirus proteins and making a simple virus antigen or protein capture test. So when people get infected with the virus, the virus has proteins on it. The virus breaks down and sheds proteins, but the proteins being there and they and, and respiratory secretions means that the person is infectious. Uh, whereas the PCR test, the, the genetic test called PCR polymerase chain reaction test, that can be positive and the virus could be dead, but the genetic material still be around. What we need, what society needs is a very inexpensive, $5 or less, and widely available, eventually in the form of like a pregnancy test. So people can take little cassettes and take them home with them and test themselves every day. And so this is just how this test works. The inverted and upright Ys here represent the antibodies that can capture, uh, in this case on the left-hand side, the spike protein, on the right-hand side, another protein of the virus called nucleocapsid. By capturing both of these, the test uh, has been made to be very, very sensitive um, and uh, uh, inexpensive. And here's how we hope to use it. Uh, we have the genetic test. It's both commercially available and the one at Duke. Uh, and when you combine it with an antigen capture test, the person is infected and infectious. That means they can spread the virus, et cetera. For a, a genetic test, is when that's positive, but the antigen capture test is negative, and the research is being done now on all hundreds and hundreds of samples to verify this, that we believe this is going to show that the person is infected, but the virus is not continuing to be infectious. And so there's a, an, an international co competition called the XPRIZE competition for, to develop a rapid and inexpensive COVID-19 test. And we are some, our team is uh, one of the 190 or so semifinalists uh, in this uh, international competition. So let me go back and say, so that what I'm getting ready to show you now is a video that uh, outlines what's happened on the Duke campus beginning before the students came back and how Duke has been able to keep this campus safe for students and faculty and for all of us. A virus spread, it's kind of like a forest fire, right? And there are embers blowing into a forest and you're gonna spread from that spot, right? The tricky part is, is our trees are moving around campus. They're only stationary at night. And so you partly want to know where people are visiting and maybe there are actionable ways of adjusting the flow of people so that we have less interactions. I started championing pool testing in general a few months ago because uh, I started seeing the same trends that I saw in the early days of HIV. And the same trends were we couldn't test fast enough, we couldn't get equipment, we couldn't get reagents, and everybody was panicking over who was infected and who wasn't infected. So when you need to do um, surveillance testing, or, or even if you're, if you're 
stuck with limited supplies uh, for testing and, and symptomatic testing, what one can do is do what we call a pooled testing approach. Essentially, they're going to get the samples will get loaded into racks, uh, scanned so that we can track them. And then a portion of each of those samples will get pulled out to make the pools. And then we're going to store the rest of the sample for the, the downstream part, the deconvolution part. There's work that's been shown that you can build a pool of five, you can build a pool of 10 or build a pool of 20. So we decided to come at it from using a pool of five, which is conservative. What we're doing is to take uh, five individual samples that are coming from, uh, from uh, the campus and pull their content or an anecdote of their content into these small bites, and these ones are the bias that are actually tested. We can process up to 120 samples in less than 15 minutes, so we can sustain the throughput that is required to test the whole body of students. The workflow for this test is based on our non-human primate, SIV, viral load acid. And, you know, when Tom came to me and said, like, can you develop an assay for SARS-CoV-2, I was like, yeah, in theory, sure. The sequence for the virus is out there. Um, all I need to do is look at the sequence and look for unique areas in the sequence that are unique and specific just to SARS-CoV-2. I designed my own primers and probes uh, that will allow us to detect it in the machine. What Duke really needs to know is positive or negative, you know, detected or not detected. Um, what we're going to have is a little bit more valuable is like how infected. There's one person in the pool, we report that they take it, deconvolute it, um, and then they test each individual person. If that one person has an extremely high viral load, that could be someone who's potentially spread it to everyone. Uh, so we have an automated workflow, which is really fantastic. Uh, from start to finish, it is almost completely done by robots, uh, which means that it's a really high throughput test that we can turn around a large amount of samples in a smaller amount of time. And so we're hoping that by having this automated high throughput platform that we would be able to easily detect if someone is positive and identify that person rapidly and follow through with any isolation procedures. Then it's a matter of how we allocate those resources. Where do we go looking to learn the most about how this thing is being transmitted? So suppose I have a population of people and um, they're in one of three states. One, either they're susceptible to the disease but don't have it, they're already infected, but maybe they haven't shown it, or maybe they then have shown it, so we, we know, but, but one way or the other, then eventually they become recovered. As a mathematician, I'd, I try to use what data I can find and tell you how many people are in the infected stage. Now, why do I do that? It's because if, if I have a lot of people who are infected, then I should test more. And even more, I've got two different groups of people, and there are a lot of people that are infected over here but haven't shown symptoms, and not too many over there. Somehow I can figure that out. Then I can tell you, put all your tests over here. Testing is a component, uh, but it really has to be woven into this comprehensive, integrated approach uh, where we're asking people on a daily basis to do things they've never had to do before. You know, every single day monitoring your symptoms. And if you have certain symptoms, not to go to class, not to come to work. And that that is a really important piece. The next is, as people are coming in, we, we've had great experiences in our health system, in our labs, and now slowly as the campus is coming back to life about social distancing, if we stay apart from each other, and also if we wear a face covering. And so these things have to be the foundation pieces. And then on top of that, our testing strategy. No one has ever done this before. You know, this hasn't been done in the United States before. And it certainly has not been done on college campuses before. Um, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about um, surveillance testing uh, across the country, uh, but it, it's, it's all uh, modeling uh, and it hasn't happened. Uh, and so we're, we're on the verge of this actually happening. And so that's uh, been uh, amazingly uh, exciting and the level of uh, cooperation and 
um, really rolling sleeves up and uh, getting after it has just been amazing. This is Duke being Duke. They've put together a, uh, a team of people from, from all different areas have come together, problem solved, use some creativity and innovation of tools that we have and are trying to come up with a solution to help keep the campus safe. This is what makes Duke special, right? So people trust each other, they trust their expertise and they communicate. And that's, that's when science really shines, especially across disciplines. It means a lot to me to be a part of this project that is enabling the students to still come back and experience this fantastic learning environment. And, you know, I want to ensure that they are still able to learn and take part in this Duke experience. And at the end of the day, I'm happy that we can be helping the students and making sure that they're safe. So um, what's happened on the Duke campus? Uh, Duke is testing all the undergraduate students uh, twice a week, uh, some more frequently where they're, they're concerned about um, higher frequency of positivity. Graduate students and faculty are now starting to be tested as well. The high uh, risk athletes, football, volleyball, uh, et cetera, are being tested daily. Um, the Vaccine Institute is performing all of the testing that we're talking about. We've turned our building uh, into a war zone and they're testing boxes and tubes uh, everywhere. Um, we've done over 90,000 tests over the last few months and uh, the amazing percentage of positivity is about 0.16% of the faculty or students have tested positive. And this is, uh, in, so it's about 150 people and this is an, a low enough so that one can do contact tracing and quarantine of all of the contacts, of which it's about 400. Um, and of those, a few have turned out to be positive and their contacts can be traced. And so this is fundamentally how the epidemic is being controlled on campus. And the goal with the new antigen test is to reduce the cost and increase the testing frequency um, so that, and to make this available basically uh, at cost for free. Um, uh, to, uh, to Duke initially and then to whoever needs it. The CDC is featuring Duke. Uh, uh, I need to give a shout out for the team led by Tom Denny, um, that, that the CDC is featuring Duke as the gold standard for how to manage the opening of a university during the COVID-19 pandemic. An article is coming out on Friday. It's in Morbidity and Mortality Weekly, MMWR. And uh, you should look for it on the CDC website. It's a wonderful article. And one of the things that they found uh, and in this, uh, reported in this article, is that 50% of those that were positive were asymptomatic. And some of the asymptomatic individuals had very high viral loads, up to 30 million. And so these asymptomatic individuals would be the quote super spreaders. And it's been thought and worried about that this is a problem, but this is really remarkable prospective data that this is the case. So how do we prepare to finish up? Uh, Duke has made an investment in readiness. The 15 years of research that Carmichael talked about with the Vaccine Institute, we have over 260 members. We have the NIH Regional Biocontainment Laboratory where we can do this work completely safely. We now have manu vaccine manufacturing facility and recruited a team of professionals from the pharmaceutical industry. And then infrastructure um, with uh, these large grants for HIV development called CHAVI or CHAVD. Uh, 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 quality assurance uh, contracts from the NIH. DHVI is responsible for the quality assurance of all extramural NIAID HIV research in the world. And then the DARPA pandemic um, prevention program for the past number of years. So in summary, what is our story? Duke and DHVI were able to respond quickly to the COVID-19 pandemic because we were primed and ready and we're primed and ready for the next pandemics. Our three-part strategy for COVID-19 has been focusing on neutralizing antibody development for prevention and treatment, second-generation vaccine development for potency, durability, and escape mutants of current vaccines, and rapid test development. Uh, testing is so important, as is the practical aspects of wearing masks and social distancing. We're developing a pan, finally, for the future, we're developing a pan-coronavirus vaccine for the next pandemic. And Duke and DHVI aims to answer the question, can there be a vaccine for everything? And so we're part of international uh, consortia and we get um, 
uh, announcements um, fairly frequently about where outbreaks are so we can decide uh, what do we need to plan for for the future for whatever virus or, or, or bug may be coming up. And this is DHVI in the days before the pandemic, before social distancing, we're 260 strong. We've been having about 130 uh, working continuously on campus since the beginning of the epidemic. To be, we were cleared that we had to stop all other work such as our HIV work and what have you, which we've now re, re begun in the last three months, but we were allowed to continue all the COVID-19 work. Um, and I can't tell you how proud I am of uh, all these individuals, just amazing, amazing people. That's all I have. Um, here's my contact information. I'm happy to answer questions now. If people have questions offline, I'm more than happy to, uh, for you to contact me either by email or, or text. Um, and uh, I'll stop there. Bart, thanks so much. Um, and uh, I can tell you firsthand, you've got a bunch of questions here. So you'll get a chance to answer some of these in real time and besides later. Was as a on a personal note was really amazing. I'm looking at this chat and questions. I see a bunch of friends from <laughs> from a long time uh, that uh, that are just tells you uh, going back at Duke. Uh, in fact, I'm going to take a question from a friend in one second. I think it's one to set the stage. Uh, so um, Nelson, I see you you posted something. Hello to you, by the way. Thanks for your comments. I miss miss talking and seeing you. Um, you asked a really poignant question. I think is really important, which is. Um, what advice, Bart, would you give to people who are skeptical about being inoculated um, for the fear of adverse effects? That's a, that's a question for the country, let alone our audience. What, what would you say to that one? Yeah, I, I think I would, I would, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the data, uh, insist on seeing the data. The FDA is committed to transparency. Um, I listen to my mentor uh, who says, look at the data to decide. Uh, look at the safety data, make sure that the trials are allowed to be finished, and it looks like they are going to be allowed to be finished, and um, uh, the, the data, I think, will, will be helpful. The data being how safe is it, and what are the side effects, and what can we expect? What are the animal data? And that's why we've spent all this time and, and, and effort to um, uh, gather data from um, uh, the animal models, because the, the fact that the uh, Pfizer vaccine and hopefully the Moderna vaccine, because it's very similar, it's going to protect in a similar manner, we hope. Um, these vaccines and other vaccines have protected in these animal models quite readily. Uh, this is not like HIV, where the body doesn't want to make the right kind of antibodies. The body is happy to make these kinds of antibodies against COVID-19. And so um, it's, it's all good signs for vaccine development. And so all I can say is, with regard to the safety of antibodies. The, the other is, is that we have no data yet that antibodies are going to be negative. And the animal trials I talked about are very important. And the other bit of information is that this issue, you heard of convalescent serum. Convalescent serum is uh, blood serum taken from other people who have gotten better and gotten well from COVID-19 and then been given to people who are very sick. There's still some debate about how much it helps, but what is is known, it's been given to over 30,000 people now, and and it hasn't caused enhanced disease. That's Those are really good data in humans. So um, uh, as more and more data come out, we're going to become more and more comfortable with this, and then it's going to be our responsibility to message this to the public who are justifiably concerned because this has all happened so quickly. Thank, thank you, Bart. I mean, that, that's, uh, by the way, you've got all sorts of positive comments. I'm going to go to, to someone who both gave a positive comment, but a really interesting question as well. Another uh, friend of mine who I haven't talked to for a long time, Tadra, you, you brought up, um, first of all, she said amazing uh, exclamation point on your presentation. So, and I, and I second that. But she, she asked a question earlier. Uh, and it gets into you know the, the differences across various subgroups. And specifically, she she started out by asking about Pfizer. Like, do you know whether the Pfizer study include, for example, children or pregnant pregnant women? And and more broadly, you know, how do we? And this gets back to also Nelson's question question about feeling comfortable uh, about how you know taking this. You know, how how do we? How has there been a look at good, good uh, on cross sections and various subgroups? 
Yeah, great, great question. Very, very important. I'll tell you what I know. Uh, the Moderna announced, Moderna trial announced that 31% of their participants were underrepresented minorities. As you know, minorities have been particularly hard hit uh, with this epidemic. Don't fully know why, but it's important to know, does the vaccine work in that group as well? Aged individuals are also important because aged individuals um, uh, also are hard hit uh, with this virus. And so companies either have or have, are beginning to enroll older individuals and open these up to older individuals. With regard to children, um, uh, I believe Pfizer has just started to enroll children. Uh, I know they have at Duke. And so that's, that's the next wave since it looks like it's safe in adults. Pregnant women, I think the discussion is ongoing. I'm not aware that pregnant women have been vaccinated yet. So I just, I'm not uh, up to speed on that one. Um, I don't think it's uh, has happened yet, but it is under discussion that I know. Okay, thank you for answering that. I know again, that is a, like I agree, that's a great question on lots of people's mind. Sounds like more, more data to come throughout yeah. as, as it's developed. Um, so let me let me be remiss not to ask you a more technical question, which are a level of expertise. Um, uh, Jim King asked a question: What makes uh, messenger RNA vaccine inoculated cells um, <clears throat> stop producing the translated protein? What makes it stop? Yeah. Yeah. Stop, yeah. You know that's that's a great question. So there's there's two kinds of uses of genes. One is where you put it in a replicating vector that integrates, that inserts itself into our genetic material, and then it just keeps going. And that's one of the problems for a therapy. How do you turn it off? And so molecular biologists are working on how do you turn off those genes when you don't want them, or in case you get a side effect or what have you. Um, messenger RNAs, uh, in contrast, are not integrating. They don't get into our genetic material. They are very fragile pieces of genetic material that are encapsulated in what's called lipid nanoparticles, a covering of, of uh, lipids or fat. Um, and that protects the RNA until it can get and helps it get into to cells, the muscle, the liver cells, what, whatever the cells are that uh, it gets into. And these things go all over the body and, and the effect lasts for three or four weeks uh, in producing either the antibody or the spike protein for the, for the vaccine. Um, and then um, um, it's eventually degraded. And so for an antibody, if it, if it makes antibody for three weeks and then the antibody itself lasts for another three weeks or a month, and you're getting two months of protection while we're waiting on a vaccine or whatever, that might be useful for uh, healthcare providers, people in nursing homes, what have you. Um, depends on how rapidly the vaccine is available and what have you. Um, so that's really the difference. And so it stops on its own. It hangs around for about three, three weeks. Um, and then uh, goes away. That's really good for, for vaccines because it's almost like a continuous release kind of thing of giving the immune system, you know, like a three week infection or something and uh, getting the immune system trained to make a good response. Once again, you took a technical question and you answered it in a way that hopefully most people can follow. I'm not a biologist, but I definitely can follow what you were saying. Let me, let me, um, let me shift gears back to a, another practical question that uh, I see in it being asked in different ways. So I'm going to just summarize the question a bit. Um, you know, people want to know that if they get it, if they uh, get the vaccine, you know, how long will it, how should they think about it lasting? Um, and, and how do we track that um, in terms of uh, <clears throat> how long it lasts and feeling comfortable about that? How should we think about that? Yeah, Carmichael, that's just a great question. There's a lot in that question. So number one is, um, let's talk about how long it might last. Well, the, the epidemic itself is only just now, just about a year old, and the vaccination started, you know, and earliest one started in March. So uh, we've got about seven or eight months of uh, how, how long this, this, this antibody lasts. Um, the data are, are, I think, data are about to come out and show that, and, and here we go back to how does our immune system work? Our immune system works by making antibodies with an initial big burst of antibody from, from immune cells that don't last very long. And then, then that level comes down because you don't want the immune system wide open for long periods of time. 
and then it comes down and then there are immune cells that have memory that, that last a long time and, 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 and slowly crank out antibody. And so uh, with other, we, we made a, a Zika vaccine um, and followed the non-human primates for a year. And what happened is, is that the antibodies went up and then they just sort of stayed up and then uh, we followed them for a year. This is with messenger RNA. And so with proteins, uh, the, the antibodies tend to go up and then come down and, and, and then level off at some level and, uh, and then gradually uh, drop off. And so it's gonna be uh, really interesting to see and we'll have these data in a year, year and a half, whatever. And the data are starting to come in because now, as I said, we're seven, eight, nine months into this. Um, and so uh, we can expect data on that say by the end of the year to know, okay, well, is it, is it really, really bad? Or it's actually looking pretty good. The other good news is, is that in the animal models and then in the Pfizer vaccine data, um, uh, we'll, we'll see, you know, do, do the people who got in, didn't, who weren't protected, uh, how long out were those? Were those early on where they had high levels of antibody or were they way out where they didn't have much high levels of antibody? Um, and then it's so a 10% of people weren't protected. And that brings us up to the second point is, if 10%, that's, that's still one out of 10, you've got a one out of 10 chance of getting the vaccine and you're not gonna be protected. What, what does that mean? How do we deal with that? Well, for, for the foreseeable future, I think uh, until we learn a lot more, we're all gonna be doing wearing masks and to some degree social distancing until we figure all, all this out. Now, it is not known. What, one bit of data that will come out of all these efficacy trials are what's called the correlates of protection. What is it? that protected. And so the NIH and the companies are gearing up once these trials are finished to study the people who were protected and study the people that weren't protected and figure out what was the immune response uh, that protected them. In the monkeys, it was neutralizing antibody. So they've got that to go on. And then if it's neutralizing antibody, what level of neutralizing antibody protected? So for influenza, we know that if you have a certain neutralizing antibody titer of one to 40, and you're gonna be protected because people have studied that for years and years and years. And so once those data come out, then there are tests that um, where you can get a neutralizing antibody test done on your blood or a surrogate test that implies that um, uh, and, and begin to figure out if we're infected. We just don't have the data right now to be able to do that right now. And so uh, we're gonna be social distancing and wearing masks for a good long while. And we, we it, uh, that, uh, we're just going to have to wait until a lot more data come out. Gotcha. Um, got it. Very, very. Thank you for that answer. And you know, as you ask questions, I try to I answer these questions. I try to think about what's the next logical question. Here's one I'm going to read to you without editorial. I'm gonna, not going to edit this. I think it's perfectly worded. Are there any um, Are there any ways to monitor CD8 T cell responses as another surrogate for vaccine response? Re vaccine response <laughs> after vaccination especially if the protective antibody levels decrease within months after receiving the actual vaccine? Yeah, well, that's just a, a great question. What are CD8 T cell responses? The immune system can make antibodies that neutralize bugs and viruses. They can also, their cells can fight off infections and they fight off, the cells fight off infections by um, killing virus infected cells. So instead of going after the virus and preventing it from infecting, uh, CD8 T cells, it's just the name of the cells, can uh, become killer T cells and kill virus infected cells. Now, most virus infections not only induce neutralizing antibodies, but they also induce the other arms of the immune system, the cell, you want to kill virus infected cells as well as the, prevent the virus from infecting anymore. And so usually it's a combination of both. Um, high levels of neutralizing antibodies can protect, as, as we've shown with uh, infusing antibodies into animals and, and what have you. But in people, particularly uh, the, uh, for durability of responses, you'd, you'd love to have the, these, these T cells, these CD8 cells tend to hang around a lot longer than the antibody. Now, uh, <clears throat> the practical problem is, is that the data that have come out in animals and in humans have shown that the design of the messenger RNA it induces great antibodies and great T cells to help the antibodies, but induce no CD8 cells or very, very, very low CD8 cells. The way natural infection does induce CD8 cells as the, the question uh, implies. 
And so uh, we're actually looking hard now at designs of mRNAs for induction of CD8 cells. This is very important, not only for COVID, but for our HIV work. As I said, we've been working on messenger RNAs for four years, and I think the, the HIV vaccine is gonna to have to be very complicated with a series of immunizations. And practically, mRNAs are gonna be the, the most practical way to make this kind of vaccine. And to be able to, we know that killer T cells are really important, not only for COVID, but for HIV. And so we're working hard on that, but it's a really, really good question. And um, it's gonna be interesting that the CHIMP ad, the AstraZeneca vaccine, that vector has its, one of its positive traits of inducing CD8 cells. Mm -hmm. the, two, the two vaccines that are proteins will not induce CD8. So, so there's really only one vaccine right now of those five that we discussed that induces CD8 cells. Gotcha. That's interesting to know right there. I'm going to take, an, I'm going to take the next few questions that we try since we're a little past top of the hour and go to some really broad ones that affect the whole country. And I'm going to take a little liberty on something that the group doesn't know. It's a conversation I was having with you before, just before we started. I think everybody would love to hear this. We see you across the country, mainly because of what's going on in, in universities and academia, different schools testing in different ways. And one of the benefits of the testing now is that people in, in lots of schools, Duke being one of them, are testing people who are asymptomatic. Um, and you, you commented to me something that you're seeing in the data of testing people who are showing no symptoms and how that translates to their viral load and uh, ability to be a spreader. Can you tell people a little bit what you said to me? Because I think it's important for people to hear. Yeah, well, and, and absolutely. And so as, as the, the Duke team has, has done the 90,000 tests and found uh, 150 or, or more uh, folks who are positive, 51% um, of the initial, those initially tested were asymptomatic. They had no symptoms. So if we were only testing people who called up to the student health and said, I'm not feeling good today, and they would say, come on over and get a test, we would pick up 50% of those folks. But then if you include the contacts of the positives, the asymptomatic positives, and those that um, uh, are contacted and quarantined, and of those, a few of those then became infected from that asymptomatic person. Then you're looking, and then you look at the total number of people that Duke has found who are infected from those asymptomatic people, we would have missed 75% of the infected people on campus. And therefore we would not be tracing 75% of those folks. And therefore there's no way to stop the epidemic by just looking at the symptomatic individuals. So it's, it's one of the reasons that this particular bug <clears throat> has, has had this incredible ability to rapidly encircle the globe and be a pandemic organism. That is one that they, it's, it, well, three. One is it's so transmissible. Two, that asymptomatics um, are quite infectious. And some of those asymptomatics had, uh, had virus loads up to 30 million. Um, and so they could be super spreaders. And then the third thing is, is that the mortality from this particular coronavirus is far, far less than SARS and MERS, the first two outbreaks. They did not go pandemic, but their mortality was anywhere between 15 and 40%. And so they killed a lot more people and therefore pre which prevented the spread. So the biology of those viruses is different than this virus. This is the, the perfect storm. It's not quite that lethal. And so it's, it's able, and it's able to be spread uh, all over uh, the globe. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I'm going to combine two questions into one, two safety questions that I think people would want to hear answers to. So the one, one question is um, that we've got is uh, if, um, if, if, if someone gets the vaccine, does talking about being a spreader, um, can they still be a carrier um, and spread, um, you know, spread the virus, even though they, they have the vaccine and um, if they get exposed? Uh, and the second question relates again to like the impact of vaccines. And, um, you know, we hear so much about, we, we're tracking so much uh, the binary outcome of people dying. And what we're, we don't talk as much about is just the overall damage that happens uh, beyond someone just, you know, uh, losing their life. And so the question then comes, if, uh, we, we know that the virus can do more than just uh, other things and just kill you. Um, how would the vaccine um, do in terms of similar responses? Do the, does the general public have to worry about, um, you know, safety 
beyond just um, you know uh, death with due to the vaccine. So just really around it, how does the vaccine work, you know, and impact us? Well, uh, two marvelous questions and very important questions, and the answer to both of them in general, and I'll come back to each one of them, what do we know now, is that the answer to these questions will come out of these efficacy trials. But this is unprecedented because there, there may be as many in a year, there may, we may have data on six different vaccines, 30,000 to 40,000 people a piece in all different demographic kinds of groups that will be uh, collated together to, to provide really, really good data on these questions. And usually this takes 10, 15 years to acquire. We'll be acquiring, we as a society uh, will be acquiring these data in, in, a, in a year's time. Uh, so the question, the first question is about, you know, if I get the vaccine, maybe I won't get sick, but can I be a carrier and spread it around? All I can say to that is, is that number one is those data will come out of the clinical trials, the, the, the vaccine efficacy trials um, uh, as to uh, <clears throat> how many people who've gotten the vaccine will still be able to eat, themselves get sick and spread it around. And then B, um, we've not seen, seen the carrier, carrier state in the animal models. Um, now, the, there are two caveats there is that the animal models in general are models of, do you get the virus or not? Do, do, do your lung cells get infected? But they're not good models of the disease. So it's not a perfect comparison to the human who does obviously get sick and get the disease. So we're gonna to have to learn that from the clinical trials. But we've not seen persistence of the virus rather over a two week period of time. And for example, in monkeys, the virus basically goes away. Um, and uh, there have been studies of, can you be reinfected with the virus, say a month or two months later in a monkey? And the answer is uh, you can be reinfected, but uh, the virus load is much, much, much lower or not at all. So you're either protected or you can be infected. Now, back in the nineties with the cold viruses that caused the common cold, the coronaviruses that look a lot like SARS-CoV-2, people were actually challenged with those they got infected, and then a year later, they were re-challenged again. They got infected again, but they didn't get sick the second time. And um, uh, during that uh, interim time, uh, they became negative. So we're just going to have to learn this. Now, as far as the, the vaccine-inducing long-term effects or effects like have been described in the late press as long haulers, uh, people who have uh, uh, fatigue and malaise and uh, a variety of symptoms. We're just really learning about this disease and all the organ systems that it involves, and it can involve the heart, the brain, et cetera. Um, again, all of that information is going to come out of the maybe six times 30,000, that's 180,000, almost 200,000 people initially getting the vaccine are going to be followed very closely. Because we know that, that from the first studies with the first vaccines, they're uh, not serious side effects in the 15,000 that got the vaccine because half get the vaccine, half get placebo. Um, but what about those side effects that occur one in 50,000, one in 100,000? That's the post, post licensure surveillance is gonna be really, really important. We, we haven't had a vaccine in a long time that has the possibility to go into billions of people. We need to know that. Gotcha. Bart, I'm just going to have to tell you now I'm doing two more questions because I'm not firing these at you and you're answering them great. So let me let me tell you. So I'm going to do one question. Um, again, it's more of a general question that lots of people have all around the wor world and another one that's very specific to Duke. Um, the, the one for all around the world, um, the low temperatures in which one has to store uh, the vaccine. Um, and I know that's not necessarily for all the vaccines if they all the different programs get approved, but that's what we've got right now. What are the uh, implications of that? How do you and your team think about that? Um, and how should we be thinking about that as from a global, on a global basis? All right, say that one more time. The low temperature storage um, of the vaccine itself, um, <clears throat> what's the overall implication of that in the short term and, and in the longer term as you see other things come online? Yeah, that's a very good question. And someone also asked, so why do you have to store it at low temperature and what have you? Right. So what the FDA asked the vaccine manufacturers to do is to do what's called stability testing. And so you take, a you take a vaccine and you put it on the shelf at room temperature and you put it at 
in the in the refrigerator at four degrees and you put it in the freezer at minus tw at minus 20 and minus 80 and minus 100 and then you follow each one of those conditions over time and you say how by certain criteria how long is this vaccine stable and in the right shape such that when it goes into the body etc and with messenger rna as i said earlier it's a fragile genetic molecule and um uh, so I, I assume that when those stability tests were done, that the minus 80 degrees or, or colder uh, was uh, uh, where the stability was. And so this is a technological issue um, of, um, uh, that vaccine developers uh, deal with all the time of um, uh, how to make a vaccine uh, such that it's transportable and can go to places where you don't have sophisticated minus 80 freezers. And, and, and all of this, uh, but in the immediacy of this, um, we're being faced with the logistics of how do you um, roll out a vaccine to 350 million people uh, where the vaccine can only be taken out of the, the freezer uh, five hours before administering it. And the implications are that it may have to be administered at hospitals. Well, that's gonna be a big problem because hospitals are already overwhelmed. And so that's just, that's what's being discussed like this week. Uh, and I don't fully have an answer for it, but I suspect that the distribution of the vaccine, once they're available, will be uh, through a variety of, of mechanisms that we have for distribution of influenza vaccines to everybody in the country, um, but more on a more emergent basis with this caveat in there that it's going to have to be where there are existing minus 80 uh, freezers in order to be able to store this material. So I don't, I don't have a really good answer there, but I do know it's being discussed. Gotcha. Well, thank you so much. I got one last question. Um, I think that you'll, you'll love. Um, and that's the practical question of everybody so proud of what you and, um, and the team has done and what that represents for Duke. That we also to ask ourselves, how can we as alumni um, as parents, um, as uh, friends of Duke and definitely DHVI, uh, how, what instruction would you give us to, to uh, how we can be helpful, um, you know, in the months, in the year to come? Well, thanks for that. And, um, you know, it takes a village. And so I would just say, share our story, um, uh, tell folks about it. Uh, people who are interested, please uh, feel free to share my contact information. I'm happy to talk to folks. I'm happy to learn what other people are doing, um, who, who might become partners, who might uh, have expertise that we don't have. Um, it takes a village. So just please uh, share our story. So last fun fact, as I transition to hand my moderator role over, um, I just want everybody to know that one of Bart's um, greatest um, accomplishments was the fact that he has a daughter named Laura who is taking up the torch to fo focus on climate change. She's a, a geochemist at Va Vassar, travels all around the world trying to fight climate change. So this is a family affair trying to keep the world healthy, uh, safe, and secure. And we, we thank you for that so much and uh, across the board. Thank you so much, Carmichael. You're very kind. And thank you and Bart and Carmichael for what could not have been a timelier topic for us today. And you do make us really proud. Good morning, everyone. I am Sterling Wilder, a member of the Duke class of 1983 and the Associate Vice President of Alumni Affairs. And it is great to be with you here virtually in Boston for this fall's business breakfast. We appreciate Duke Boston opening this program to alumni all along the East Coast. And of course, thank you so much for attending. Bart, thank you for taking this time away from your very busy schedule to share your presentation showing us the important role that Duke is playing at this time and specifically the work being done at the Duke Human Vaccine Institute since the start of the pandemic. Carmichael, thanks for being our peerless moderator this morning and for a terrific conversation with Bart that helped us make sense of what we are hearing every day in the news and certainly what is on all of our minds. I also wanna mention that this program was co-sponsored by the Duke School of Medicine. And I especially wanna thank my colleague, Ellen Medeiros, the Vice President for Duke Health Development and Alumni Affairs for her support and assistance in bringing this event to our alumni today. In closing, I wanna acknowledge that today of course is Veterans Day and that Duke is holding a virtual ceremony with President Price to recognize and honor those who serve 
or have served in the military. And the event will be streamed at 11 on the Duke University YouTube account. Thanks again to Duke Poston for hosting this event and to you for attending and have a great day. And of course, continue to be forever Duke. Take care. Thank you.